Andrew Doyle is an Irish journalist who's perhaps best known as the creator of the Twitter personality Titania McGrath, a parody of an ultra-woke 24-year-old that he says is a militant vegan who thinks she's a better poet than William Shakespeare. Though the 43-year-old Doyle describes himself as a left-winger, he's a fierce critic of cancel culture and proponent of Brexit. He holds a doctorate from Oxford in early Renaissance poetry, is the host of the new nightly show GB News, and a columnist for Spiked Online. He's also the author of the new book, Free Speech and Why It Matters, a comprehensive, learned, and compelling argument in favor of unfettered debate and open expression. Reason talked with him about why cancel culture is on the rise, how to combat it, and what Titania McGrath is up to as she approaches her quarter-life crisis. Andrew Doyle, thanks for talking to Reason. Thank you for having me. So, Free Speech and Why It Matters, what is the elevator pitch of the book? Well, I suppose uh, it's a book that I didn't think I would ever have to write. I think the idea uh, came to me because uh, we are in a situation at the moment where, although it's not quite crisis point, uh, we are definitely detecting uh, more and more people who are willing to let slide the principle of free speech, which I consider to be the foundational uh, principle of our society. And um, there, a lot of this is a, a sort of well-intentioned thing, but there are people who are moving towards, let's say, uh, more aggressive hate speech laws or uh, urging further big tech censorship or um, uh, this kind of rise of what we call cancel culture, this kind of uh, strategy of attempting to uh, to shut down certain opinions, unfashionable opinions or viewpoints or ideas or even jokes. Um, and this is this. The reason why I thought the book was important was that this is happening more often now, uh, the, you know, whereas about 15 years ago, I would we, you know, everyone. It was just a given. Everyone just agreed that free speech was this very foundational principle, and 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 it was very important. Now, the rise of this kind of free speech skepticism, I, I find a bit disturbing. And actually, the book isn't really aimed at the the activists who just simply don't believe that free speech is a good thing. Um, it's it's more at the majority of people who, broadly speaking, believe in in free speech, but they're also nervous about demagogues uh, saying hateful things or or the the potential impact of language. Uh, and it's or, been a while since uh, we've dusted off the actual reasons for free speech. I mean, right. it's become a kind of blank bromide. You know, in, in early on in the book, you, you uh, talk about we are left facing that confusing and rare phenomenon, the well-intentioned authoritarian. And you talk uh, at the opening of the book, which is just a, a fantastic kind of set piece, in a section called We Need to Check Your Thinking. You write, between 2014 and 2019, almost 120,000 non-crime hate incidents were recorded by police forces in England and Wales. This sort of development has left a, a substantial number of inquiries, etc. What is a non-crime hate incident, and why are the police collecting such data. This is a very interesting point because recently the Home Secretary here, Priti Patel, has, has, has said to the, the College of Policing, uh, the College of Policing being the body that is responsible for the training of all police officers in the UK, um, that they shouldn't be advising police officers to record non-crime or investigate non-crime. Um, however, they still haven't updated their website or changed that. I think you're going to see this battle between the police, the College of Policing specifically, and Priti Patel. There is a culture within the, the UK police that they believe it is partly their responsibility to uh, investigate certain uh, language, uh, certain linguistic um, misdemeanors, shall we say, and, and to ensure that people aren't being offensive. It is a cultural problem within the police force. So a non-crime hate incident, as, I, as you say, many, many thousands of which are recorded every year, is when uh, so, for instance, if 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 someone said something mean to me, and I interpreted that as being coming from a say a homophobic basis or whatever I wanted to, however I wanted to interpret that, I could phone the police and say I believe um, it was my perception uh, that this was uh, an attack based on uh, b uh, my sexual orientation, which is one of the five protected characteristics. What are what are the, the other government. ones? Do you remember them offhand? Uh, okay, so it's race, uh, gender. I, uh, it's race, gender, disability. Um, religion, and uh, I think that the last one is uh, gender identity, right. I think. Uh, I would have to double check that. Um, but so do you think people, you know, like short people were like, well, you know, again, we are <laughs> just written out of the discussion? 
Uh, well, the, exactly. I mean, there have been calls for sort of why aren't vegans in there and this kind yeah. of thing. Um, I've actually got the list here. Uh, it's yes, it's it's disability or perceived disability, race or perceived race, religion or perceived religion, sexual orientation or perceived sexual orientation, or a person who is transgender or perceived to be transgender. What you see there, though, is the this constant repetition of the concept of perception. Yeah, right. because it doesn't really matter whether uh, someone had. Um, uh, attacked me with a homophobic motive or not it's whether i decide that that was their motive so it's a bizarre and then this is thing. not a crime but the police is keeping tabs which uh, you know it's, we, a non, I, it's a non-crime it's non-crime yeah. the police's explanation when the police are challenged on this the explanation is that uh, non-crime can lead to, or, or that crime is always preceded by non-crime <laughs> Which I would have thought I think was it's always succeeded by non-crime as well, right? I mean, unless <laughs> it, we just cross a line and then it's just crime all, you know, for the rest of ex eternity. Exactly. It's, it's um, yeah, it's a, and it's an absolute given. So, so it is recorded. So the police record it. Sometimes they investigate. And in all cases, it is recorded. And the problem with that is, well, firstly, the police have no business investigating people for non-crime. That's the first thing. But the, the massive principle uh, You know, aside, you're talking to somebody who you have to convince me the police have a right to invest me, investigate me for crime. So well, then, forget, well, then yeah, you'll, yeah. yeah. So this yeah. is way out of your league. You know, you, you, you wouldn't tolerate this at all. But, but in addition to that, their, their idea that if, you, you know, hateful words inevitably lead to violence is interesting because uh, th th there was an article recently talking about the number of these n recorded non-crimes that have actually led to crimes is, is precisely zero. Yeah. So even by their own statistics, they know that this is bunkum. Um, but they, there is this culture. I mean, recently we had the police in Merseyside near Liverpool or in Liverpool um, standing. There was a, a picture, a photograph that went viral and they were standing in front of this digital billboard. And on the billboard, it said the slogan, being offensive is an offence. Uh, and this was flanked by these very menacing looking police officers. And of course, this went viral because lots of critics were saying, well, actually, being offensive isn't against the law. And the, one of the, the, the striking things about that I is thought that, that it, you know, at least 90 percent of English culture is being offensive. Right. It's important to us. That's that's how we get along. Um, but I think. It, what was interesting is that was a, it wasn't just some sign that some rogue police officer had sketched up and put up. It was a, it was a digital billboard that obviously there'd be meetings, discussions. Uh, people had discussed the language that should be. So there's obviously a culture within the police force where they think that it is their job to investigate people for being offensive. And the, the scary thing about it is actually they had kind of inadvertently hit upon a truth because it is against the law to be offensive in this country. Quite explicitly, right. the 2003 Electronic Communications Act says that if you post material that is quote unquote grossly offensive, that is the uh, the stipulation for criminal prosecution. So actually, we are in. It, it, that's there's another reason why I thought this book needed to be written. Because and that that phrase, we need to check your thinking, which came from a, a policeman who was calling up somebody. Right. That is. I mean, you know that. I mean, it's one thing if that's happening within the context of a classroom or even a boardroom, but the idea that the police would be the agency that would be checking your thinking is kind of terrifying. Yeah, because it's straight out of Orwell, isn't it? It is thought crime. And um, I know that's become a cliche, but what are you going to do? That's exactly what well, it is. And and it's, yeah, and it's it's interesting that it's out of Orwell, but it's also by way of Burgess, right, in Clockwork Orange, where the police are revealed without any romanticism to be, you know, a bunch of droogs who are, you know, as violent as the criminals they're supposedly apprehending. Certainly, that's where we are in America. And I mean, this is an overstatement. But, you know, the last people you want policing things are the police, right? I think everyone should read Clockwork Orange. They should read uh, 1984. And if they read The Crucible as well, we'd probably be in a, a, a much better situation. I love Clockwork Orange, by the way. I love the way that after about 10, 15 pages, your mind just adjusts to the language. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. really smart. It's, uh, you know, a side note, but what's fascinating is that the version that was published in the United States uh, left off the final chapter in which, yes, Alex, I know this. spoiler alert, Alex is redeemed or, or grows out of it, actually, because he's a young child. And um, that has a radically different, you know, it, it leaves the book with a radically different message. Well, um, I mean, it, it yeah. feels like then he's sort of saying, well, uh, there is an inevitability to, to a violent impulse in male youth. Right. Uh, and he might be onto something there. Um, but, 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 and, you know, that, and, 
it also does... one that gets grown out of. Um, mm. I mean, there's a... Well, I mean, we, we know that, I mean, violent crime past the age of 40 yes. decreases hugely. We know this. So, you know, there's, there's, there's something in that. So, um, you know, the idea of having the police checking your thinking and, and what you were just discussing is, is one sign that we are in a different era when it comes to kind of the way that we talk about, the way that we think about free speech and, and potential offense arising from, you know, just kind of an open discourse. What are some of the other examples? I mean, before we talk about free speech being, you know, the, the problems with it being under attack, can we document a little bit more how we know it is under attack? When I talk about, um, well, we, I've spoken about hate speech laws. I mean, there's there's the fact that we have that just in terms of legislation, which I think is a major issue, which you obviously are less likely to have given your First Amendment. Right. We Although don't, we, we don't. do have certain, you know, there are times where that is, but the, the types of things which... Uh, you know, are are frankly becoming more conceivable here, but in Europe as well as in England, you know, the idea that making fun of a religion or selling Nazi memorabilia is somehow illegal, that's a bridge too far. But there are types of hate crime, you know, there is hate crime legislation mm. which intensifies uh, criminal penalties. Sure. Uh, you've, you've got that. You've also got a movement in America from certain activists to see that the, that hate speech doesn't count within the, uh, uh, the constitutional protections. Right. So for, yeah. And and then, of course, you've got Prince Harry coming over there and telling you that your First Amendment is. Yeah, we, we need to talk about that. You know, free okay. trade, <laughs> free trade is a, is a fine thing, but not when we're, t you know, this is no, an no. import that uh, I think we really should have put a, a very high tariff on. I, yes, I'm sure. So anyway, in terms of other examples, so we, yes, so in the UK, then specifically in the UK, we have got the Public Order Act and the uh, Communications Act, both of which encode kind of hate speech legislation across Europe. Every most most major European countries have late hate speech legislation, which differ depending on the country. A good way to have a look at that is Paul Coleman's book Censored, which actually reproduces facsimiles of all of the hate speech legislation. So you can see it for yourself. In fact, the, the most of the book is is is, is uh, just reproductions of the of those laws. Um, Yes, yeah, so there's there's the the legal side of things, and then there is the cultural side of things, and and uh, I think it goes back to what you said about how, you know, I felt that I had to reiterate <laughs> and sort of polish up uh, the the um, a trans historical defense of free speech, which is something that we forget, and I think it is something that you have to kind of not take for granted because it is so rare, and because we are uh, because it is so miraculous that we live in a country with free speech that we have to just continually make the case. It's not something that you you win and then it's so won for what is more. yeah what you know you you said you think free speech is is you know the, is the basic thing like everything comes after that yeah. why you know just very briefly. Why is free speech the starting point, and when when does it an, when does that defense of free speech for you emerge in a kind of uh, Anglo American or Western culture? You know, as okay, this is the first right because it's the seedbed of all other liberties. I don't think you can have freedom without the freedom to express yourself. It's why the free speech movement at Berkeley. It's why um, the early civil rights activists were all unanimous in their in their defense of free speech, because they understood that they wouldn't be able to secure any of those other liberties without the freedom to say what they thought. Uh, and that seems, and as we know, across the world, all of the, the countries in which free speech protections are poor, it is minorities who suffer the most. So there is a very important reason why we, we, we need to defend it. And particularly, the, ironically, I think that the people who are most uh, antagonistic toward the concept of free speech uh, from minority groups and minority activists, uh, those are the ones who have the most to benefit from it. So that's why I wanted to uh, write a book that they could read and would not be feel alienated by. I'm not attempting to, I'm not insulting them. I'm taking their arguments seriously uh, and, and attempting to engage with them. In terms of the, the, the cultural reason why uh, free speech defence is necessary is because of this rise of cancel culture, which is something which is often misunderstood, uh, either because people take it very literally and they say, well, no one's been actually cancelled, have they? And of course, it's a metaphor. And a lot of the social justice activists aren't particularly adept at metaphor. What we mean by this it is a kind of a system or a, 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 a strategy or an impulse to uh, to publicly shame someone, to harass and threaten someone, or to contact their employer, defame their reputation to such an extent that actually their livelihood is is damaged and 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 possibly destroyed. Uh, so it is a a, a essentially vengeful uh, a, approach to disagreement. That's what. So it's it's culture kind of is. the heckler's veto. Uh you know, yeah. writ large, writ as, as part of a cultural uh, moment. Exactly. And and there are so many examples of this. I mean, when I was writing the book and I, I mentioned, 
I, I, I was I wrote I, there's a chapter in the book on cancel culture and I thought shall I start listing the examples and I started collating them and there were hundreds and I thought this is going to go on forever so I won't do that what I'll do is I just I mention 10 or so in the footnotes mm-hmm. because right. I didn't want it to distract because it's a given it's an absolute given so the people who deny cancel culture are usually its most ardent practitioners and that I suppose they have a vested interest in denying its existence um but I mean it's indisputable I can give you some examples if it yeah, would help give give you know what's your favorite example of, of a cancel culture moment. Well, I mean, one of the first ones which really got people thinking was the cancellation of Tim Hunt, who's the uh, Nobel Prize winning biochemist, who uh, he made a joke uh, at a conference, I think it was in South Korea, and uh, it was deliberately misrepresented by a journalist. I mean, quite willfully misrepresented, that's clear, um, as being... Um, as not being a joke, in fact, um, and uh, as being a simply uh, overtly misogynistic statement. This from a man who has done so much for for women in sciences, but you know that wasn't taken into account. And by the time he got home from this uh, conference, his, he had lost his uh, fellowship and his uh, his reputation was in tatters. And this happened very, very, very quickly. Uh, and of course, in the old days, what you would do is you would uh, if you if you misunderstood a joke or something that someone had said in a conference, you would perhaps go up to that person and say, "Oh, now what was that about? That that worried me. Whatever. Let's." Resolve let's have a drink and talk about it you know not this kind of let's let's post everything online and destroy this person's career so that was a really early example but there have been many many prominent ones i mean there was the example of nick buckley in 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 the uk who's who is the founder founder of a charity which sort of focused on uh, helping young people from ethnic minority backgrounds out of poverty so this is someone who you would have thought would have been uh, you know the, the social justice activists would have absolutely adored and the intersectional activists would have loved and yet uh, they they uh, accused him of being racist because he criticized some of the aspects of the Black Lives Matter movement and and certainly some of the um, stranger demands on their website, which I believe have since been taken off. Uh, and he and this man who has done so much and devoted so much of his life and work to helping people from ethnic minority backgrounds was was smeared uh, as a racist. And and uh, another prominent example would have been Roger Scruton. Roger Scruton, of course, one of the prominent conservative thinkers in the UK uh, who, who died relatively recently. Uh, in 2019, he was supposed to be part of this um, commission, this government commission to look into housing and architecture. Uh, and uh, because he has some very interesting ideas of, uh, about this and has written extensively on it. It was called the, the Building Beautiful Commission. And um, he was interviewed by a man called George Eaton from the New Statesman, uh, and it was a, an incredibly dishonest interview. That, that not only did he misrepresent represent him in the interview it's himself, uh, Eaton quoted him on his Twitter feed, but took out key elements of the sentences. So in one case, Scruton had made a point which was explicitly anti-racist, was explicitly critical of the the the, uh, the Chinese government and the way that it you know attacked its own people, and made it look like he was making a racist statement. You know, uh, he was talking about the way in which the Chinese government treats its people like robots, you know, uh, like the inhuman. And by taking out the words, it looked like it looked like he was saying Chinese people are just like robots. They're all the same. So it was the opposite of what he admitted. And, and that I'm afraid that kind of boulderization cannot be I mean, that cannot be anything other than deliberate. Uh, so it didn't matter. The truth did not ma- did not matter. That's what happens when a journalist becomes an activist. And the, but that wasn't the worst thing. I mean. It's, it's, you know, it's astonishing that he, he kept his job after that. But that wasn't the worst thing about that kind of misrepresentation. The worst thing uh, was that the government immediately kicked him off the commission. Yeah, what's and going on there? Because that's that's the second part of this, right? I mean, you have people who feel empowered or emboldened to just make shit up about people oftentimes yeah. or or bring something, you know, in the worst possible light to to make a point or to achieve some goal. But then, you know, isn't isn't the the real blame there on the on the government committee that says like okay scruton you you know we've known you for years we don't think you're this but get the fuck out yeah exactly that that's this is the thing i'm always saying is that i feel that the problem isn't the activists themselves because there's not many of them i know they're incredibly powerful but the reason they're powerful is because uh, those in authority continually capitulate to their demands it happens again and again time and again and this is the problem none of this would have mattered if if if, if nick buckley wasn't fired if, if roger scruton wasn't ditched from the commission if tim hunt didn't lose his fellowship none of it would matter it would just be people bleating on the internet which is where what it should be um so the problem really is that people are just they don't have the guts to stand up to these bullies and that's the problem because it's an intimidatory tactic that's why you only need two or three 
uh, people of this woke mentality in any industry or any corporation before everyone capitulates because they are terrifying people. I had um, a conversation with a, uh, a writer, friend, a playwright friend of mine who was working with one of these direct, a director who was an intersectionist, woke activist style director. And he said that he started treating her like a, a dangerous dog. Because if you said the wrong thing, you would they would go for you in this vicious way. And it's, it is, that's unfortunately what's happening. Let's, uh, you know, somebody who, who, uh, spent some time in the barrel was J.K. Rowling, uh, yeah. you know, a beloved, uh, you know, children's author, the uh, creator of the Harry Potter series. She um, stepped in it in a, in a discussion about uh, trans rights and about, mm-hmm. uh, you know, kind of uh, biological essentialism, for lack of a better term. Yeah. She, you know, she she got slammed. She got attacked a lot on Twitter and elsewhere. People wrote many columns against her. But, you know, uh, practitioners of cancel culture or supporters of calling for truth, you know, just say, look, J.K. Rowling, you, you know, she wasn't hurt at all by this. Um, and in fact, you know, that this is just discourse. What's what's wrong with that understanding of cancel culture? It's very naive if you think that you are uh, that for, to be continually bombarded day in, day out by rape threats, death threats, threats of violence and misogynistic abuse is not in any way hurtful simply because you're a millionaire celebrity shows a complete lack of understanding of what it means to be human, I would have thought. Um, and that's a very, very bizarre thing. What you the best that you could say is that she hasn't been cancelled, which is true. You can't cancel JK Rowling. You can't cancel a multimillionaire. You can't cancel the most successful author in the world. You absolutely can't. No publisher in their right mind would ditch her. Uh, but they would ditch Gillian Phillip, who was the Scottish author who simply supported her on Twitter. Yeah, she got ditched by by her publisher overnight because she's not as lucrative. So so this defence that, well, because J.K. Rowling hasn't been cancelled, that proves that cancel culture doesn't exist. No, it's the opposite. It proves that it exists, but that it predominantly affects those who are not the rich and powerful. It predominantly affects normal people. And what that's- do you, oh, I was going to say, but then, and then what do you, what do you say though? And, and I actually find this a compelling um, question. I'm not sure that I agree with the, uh, with the answer, but what's actually going on is that because of the internet and because of social media and a variety of breakdowns of gatekeeper institutions, um, just in being able to control what and where people talk, but also there's that kind of jellyfish uh, dimension that you're talking about, where you know authorities will no longer actually step in to do the right yeah. thing. Um, but you know that it, what we're what we're witnessing is this glorious age where the rabble finally has the ability to directly call out and address powerful people, and it's not just people like J.K. Rowling about something about trans rights, but you know, in the United States, um, you know, uh, 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 campaigns against, I don't know, you know, people like Bill Cosby, um, who, you know, got dragged on Twitter and ultimately was canceled for a variety of sexual crimes. Um, you know, that you, there is an ability now for the common person to actually interact publicly and directly with people in power and that that's what we're actually witnessing. Um, you know, that, that the voiceless have now been given a voice and people in power don't like that. The voiceless aren't always right. I think the first thing to say is that what you're describing there is uh, uh, creating the conditions for a witch hunt mentality. Uh, it's all very well saying that uh, a lot of good can be achieved by mass mobilization online. And you could point to, I don't know, the Arab Spring or whatever you want, depending on your point of view. And you could point to sex criminals who are outed. But there are also lots of innocent people who are accused of sex crimes who are effectively tried via social media. That is not a good thing, actually. Um, And I never take accusations uh, like that seriously, even if they are overwhelming in numbers, because I know enough about history to know that uh, uh, mass accusations can often be false. Uh, And I think we shouldn't lose due process. But by the same token, it is a good thing, like you say, that people are able to to everyone's a broadcaster everyone can get their opinion out there and their ideas out there that is a good thing but that's not what we mean by cancel culture no one is saying that that you shouldn't be able to criticize celebrities this is the this is a bizarre uh, misunderstanding what Uh, you know actually i think prince harry and Meghan markle may be saying that but yeah but they are a law unto themselves aren't they you know uh, yes they are absolutely saying that but um no no one else is uh no one is saying that the problem with um you know, if people want to bombard people on Twitter, if people want to criticize celebrities, then, you know, I'm all for that. You should be able to criticize whoever you want. You should be able to be abusive and insulting to whoever you want. They don't have to listen to you. They should just block you and move on with their lives. You know, I don't, I don't, I, 
And I don't approve of it, by the way. I think civility is something we should urge at all times. Uh, I don't take anyone seriously if they're uncivil. I will block them and move on. I'm absolutely not going to waste my time talking to someone who can't uh, d- discuss like an Do adult. You, you know, at one point, uh, you, I mean, you have a doctorate in Renaissance poetry. Um, you, uh, you quote Milton, and obviously Milton in Areopagitica has a you know, a very important and enduring uh, defense of an unlicensed press or the idea that you should not have to put your thoughts through some kind of official, you know, mechanism for approval before it sees print. In the time, in Milton's time, there was a profusion of tracts and the ability for, for all sorts of people, including very much anonymously, to print and publish whatever they thought. It's yeah. kind of a glorious thing. Can you talk a little bit about how cancel culture or what we're talking about here, rather than celebrating the ability to speak, it's actually also seems to be acting in the role of the government censor that Milton is pushing back almost psychologically, right? Because it's not necessarily saying that the the government censor is going to pre-approve everything that gets published, but like we are... We're doing that work ourselves. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? It's it's almost like people are acting as government censors, you know, and... This is one of the most curious aspects of the social justice movement is because it is an establishment movement now, because, you know, it's absolutely the establishment, particularly in America. You've got Biden. Biden's administration is very much on board with it. Um, But culturally speaking, it's been in the ascendancy and has been uh, the the most powerful driving force in UK culture, even even with a Tory government in control. Uh, It it doesn't really relate to this right left debate. Um, And yet, though, that establishment line is the very thing that activists will seek to maintain through their online behavior. Uh, so this this is, it, it's almost like you don't need an inquisition. It's, it's like the pe- the people are applying the hot plates and the pincers to each other by, of their own accord. Well, this yeah. is, it's Foucault, right? I mean, that we've internalized the panopticon, essentially. So we are, you know, we're, we're doing the work for the government or, or for the power structure. We are, we are all participants. Yes, we're all the panopticon. And it's interesting, I do think, uh, Foucault would have an awful lot to say about the social justice ideology and the way that it is is a, it wields power. I mean, he pushed it's back. I mean, I, I don't want to get dragged into a, a side, uh, you know, conversation on this, but he actually did push back against that in his day. Um, you know, it's just a, interesting a to me repression. that they quote or cite Foucault as being this sort of their right. their luminary, but of course, I think they've largely yep. misunderstood him. Right. Um, you know, one of the uh, question or one of the issues that comes up and you, and you talk about it in the book is that there is a huge gulf between, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, just crudely older generations and younger generations when it comes to a belief in the value of free speech. Uh, mm. How how old are you? I'm 42. OK, so you're, uh, you know, a late uh, Gen Xer in, in American ease. Yeah, I don't yeah, know what yeah exactly. I'm on the cusp. It. Um, but millennials and Gen Z in America, you know, so people like basically 40 and under are, you know, polls and surveys show this compared to older people like me. I'm a, I'm a late boomer. Gen X people are very much more in favor of free speech. It's just we, we grew up thinking that younger people are much more, I don't know, the, you know, about this free speech. It needs to be balanced against the other concerns. Can you talk a little bit about the gulf in support for free speech and then Speak to why, you know, what happened? What happened that free speech has gone from, you know, I, I in grad school, I was taught by people who were at the Berkeley free speech movement rallies. They were pushing, you know, even into the 80s and 90s. They were like, no, everybody should be allowed to talk. That's the, that's a given. That world has totally disappeared. Yeah, I'm I'm very wary and we should all be always be very wary of just ending up uh, criticizing what the younger generation do sure. simply because they are younger and uh there are a lot of things that the younger generation have done which are better that are a lot better than than the way things were when when I was their age. Um but I think you also have to point out regression as and when it happens and not be afraid to do so simply because it is partly generational. I mean, and actually this could all be redundant anyway given that the the signs very clearly are showing that the the youngest generation generation z are pushing back against the millennial generation and and we we will probably get a free speech fight back from the very young uh because a lot of them are very very sick of it i'd say preponderance actually but nevertheless um yeah there is something generational about it and i think it is because it is uh, uh, coincidental with the rise of identity politics. And inevitably, we now have a, a substantial body of people who who believe 
um, that certain fundamental liberties are worth dispensing with uh, if if it can be said that they are um, effectively oppressing minority groups. Unfortunately, that analysis is incorrect. It isn't true. So so uh, it, it is people buying into this uh, this illusory perception and and just to, I mean I, I I'm very surprised. I remember giving a talk at a school where I asked whether. Uh, there should be legal limits on what <clears throat> on what comedians can joke about. And the fact that the majority of the pupils put their hands up really threw me because I thought this is a very is is the and and you know as as we talked about it more and more, it was very clear that this hadn't been this wasn't a thought through position. This isn't a position that they have been reasoned into. It is just the acceptable position. It's the the, the high status opinion to have. Um, and you you know and, and so therefore I think that is part of it. I think it is. Largely uh, a product of my generation more than anything. I think my generation are to blame more than anything because it is academics of my age and older who are the ones who have instilled this, this, uh, this what we call, it, I suppose, applied postmodernism. Uh, and as is, opposed it to... that, is it the idea that speech is the equivalent of violence? Is yeah. it that uh, power, you know, everything is, is, is seen in terms of power and that that's reflected in language? So in order to disrupt power relations we need to dis we need to police and regulate language could you talk a little bit about the, the yeah th this is a fair mechanism. this this is a, a way you can fairly say this is derived from Foucauldian thought and 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 the the, the work of the, the French postmodernists or post structuralists because you can say, because if you if you are convinced that our our understanding of reality is entirely constructed through language uh and therefore it makes sense doesn't it that words act like spells and incantations that when they're out of the bottle they will have this uh, effect on people and that people are you know it, it involves it, it it combines with that postmodern idea this very pessimistic view of humanity which it which, which is that we are we are malleable and, and that we are completely products of our culture to the extent that we have no agency which is something that i don't get on board with um and and moreover and most importantly and this is why I, I wrote I wrote about it in the book is that most importantly the 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 statistics and the research doesn't support this view so the the idea that um, we are just drones who re respond mechanically on cue to language in movies the arts popular culture the media it's been debunked media effects theory has been debunked over six decades of research so when we say oh it is dangerous to have a comedy show where someone uses that phrase because it will have this impact on society and make society more racist. If you're going to make that proposition, let's have the evidence. Ha you know, if you have debunked uh, all of the, the six decades of research into this, then show us your work. Let's see the notes, right? Because I think it's just faith. At the moment, it's just faith. It's just, that's why the comparison with religion works so well, because it is not something, you can't contest something if it, if it is simply asserted. Uh, without evidence. This uh, brings us back to Clockwork Orange, which, you know, it's funny. I, I think I'm going to go out and read Clockwork Orange again. Uh, it's been a while. But the idea that, you know, we are what we watch, which I think actually comes out of not out of post-structuralism, but a kind of Frankfurt School um, kind of understanding of popular culture, that we are programmed by everything we watch and we see. So Donald yeah, I mean, Duck. I Donald Duck takes his punishment, you know, in the cartoons, so that workers take their punishment in the workplace, etc. Um, and it's fascinating. In the '90s, all of this was debunked essentially, and there was a new generation of media studies and cultural studies people who were like, "No, in fact, we are end users. Like we recreate meaning. We create meaning on our own. We don't care about authorial intention, whatever that might mean." But now we're back to the idea that if somebody witnesses something, they will either model it uh, or it will have a drastic impact on them. But you're right. There's no evidence for that. I'd say that, that this pessimistic view of humanity that I'm describing probably does come from the Frankfurt School. And, and it's interesting to me that there are groups of people who want to resurrect the worst aspects of, 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 of that thinking, uh, 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 you know, uh, and, and this almost very snobbish idea really that 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 um the the media you know that popular culture i mean the the, the way in which the, the the thinkers of the frankfurt school completely dismissed popular culture and right. derided it and, and 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 felt and i've seen elements of it in recent years i remember seeing noam chomsky talking about how sports are a form of mass con control of the masses and this kind of thing and it's, I, it's I, peculiar you know, too in in a in an age of social media where things are kind of more individualized or, or mm. people are empowered to 
consume what they want when they want to produce things as well yeah. and, and engage. Um, yeah. Why do you think, and this might be beyond be the purview of, uh, of the book or, um, or this conversation, but why did identity politics ri- arise as it did, given that, you know, the kind of institutional barriers to all sorts of oppressed groups and oppressed identities, whether we're talking about racial identities or gender identities or sexual identities, these have all kind of faded in the past 20 years. Uh, It's not to say they don't still exist, but, you know, England and America, most countries are less racist, less sexist, less homophobic, um, more cosmopolitan and kind of accepting. So where does why does identity politics flourish in that kind of setting? I wish I knew the answer. I mean, I've I've heard lots of people speculate about this, and you know, one potentially convincing uh, explanation is that there is something alluring about being a victim, and once you've achieved equality, where do you go from there? Uh, you know, you you start you start have to I suppose you have to start taking responsibility for your failures, and and. You know, I mean, it's to give the example of Stonewall, which is the the leading yep. gay rights charity in the UK. I mean, they won. You know, we had mm-hmm. equal age of consent laws, we had equal marriage, we had equal hospital visitation rights and and legacy rights, and all the rest of it. So we had complete legal equality. This is not to say that homophobia was ever eliminated. I don't think it ever can be, actually. Um, Although it's been greatly reduced, hugely reduced. Yes, exactly. Yep. To to the point where no one in their right mind. Uh, even if they were homophobic, would be openly so because it would be, you know, destroy themselves uh, uh, socially, you know. Um, so they won. And then I got and they got to a point thinking, well, what can we do now? And I think a lot of people think they took on the gender I- ideology of, of, of extreme trans activism as, a, as, a, as a, a means to keep themselves going, because by that point, at the height of their success, suddenly they had corporate support. Suddenly they had uh, money flowing. They, it's a very lucrative, lucrative thing. So, um yeah, maybe it's to do with the monetary incentive. Maybe it's to do with power. You know, maybe it's to do with having some sway in society. I, I do feel sorry, though, for, for activists who are convinced that we live in the most oppressive time that has ever been, given that the opposite is true. You know, g- given that we have, that we have never, there has never been a society that is more tolerant and open and progressive than ours and less racist and less homophobic and less sexist. Not to say that none of those things still exist. I have to keep putting this obvious caveat in. But to nonetheless genuinely see fascists everywhere, seeing Nazis in every shadow, seeing homophobes and sexists and racism, that's your... If you if you live in that world of imaginary monsters, it must be absolutely horrible psychologically. So I do have some degree of pity for people who, who have bought into this mass delusion. I really do. But, it, but, but the delusion is what it is. Can you... Um, you know, many of the people who are most vociferous in trying to limit speech, whether through legal restrictions or kind of cultural imposition are from, you know, very small uh, minority groups, say, you know, trans activists you mentioned. Can you make the case to them directly that they actually need free speech more than anybody? They'll, they'll say, you know, there's too much free speech and it's attacking me. But you you argue, I think pretty persuasively, that that's exactly wrong, that it's the most marginalized people who benefit the most from free speech. Yeah. Uh, and, that you know, the studies again and again show this um there's a human rights campaign called jacob i'm going to pronounce his wrong his name wrong it's chang gama chang gama i think um and he's done work into this and looked into uh the way in which the first thing that a, a despot will do is clamp down on free speech and that that always has a negative impact on minority groups it always disproportionately affects minority groups and 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 you just need to have a sort of I suppose, a cursory understanding of history to know how this works. Or you just have to look at uh, minority groups in in Islamic states and the way that they are treated. If you're a gay person or a woman in, is, in Islamic states, your life isn't, you know, there are people who are really risking their lives to try and do something about that. Um, free speech uh, is the first thing that is to go. So in order to, uh, to, to achieve the goals that you claim that you want to achieve, you absolutely have to protect that. And I think the problem is that what they what they really mean is they want free speech protections for themselves, but not for their detractors. Uh, but of course, it's not a principle that is, uh, well, I mean, you dilute the principle when you deny it to those that you oppose. 
And I mean, you may get to control the microphone for a little bit, but inevitably you get pushed off the stage. Right. Exactly. The principle is much bigger. Yeah. Yeah. The principle Um, is much, much bigger. So, you know, one very interesting kind of uh, conundrum here is the uh, who who is policing speech or where where does speech happen in the past? And you write about this, you know, it used to be Tories in England and, you know, conservatives in America who were the ones who were really trying to police speech a lot. Now they tend to be kind of more free speechy and whatnot. But more importantly, people talk about how it's not about government censorship. It's about large social media companies, uh, Facebook, yeah. Twitter, et cetera. And you write, you know, you 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 say that libertarians like me, you know, libertarians in an American context, of, we are using old arguments when we say that Facebook is a private entity. So they get a right to basically run their platform the way they want to. But at various, and so you seem to be arguing on the one hand that they should be treated more like a common carrier where they don't get to pick and choose. They don't get to moderate the speech or who gets to use those services. But then at other times, that argument kind of goes away. And it's clear, like, you don't want the government to be in charge of regulating Facebook, right? So I, I like, how do you, how do you work your way through all of that? Yeah, I mean, you make you make it sound like I'm having a go at you specifically in the book. I, I don't take... you know, I take things very personal. <laughs> it's the only way that I feel important. I should have written yeah. libertarians like Nick Gillespie think <laughs> this, and it's ridiculous. What's he going on about? Um, yeah, it's it it is a difficult one. Um, but as the the libertarian argument only really works if it is possible to set up competitive industries, as we saw with with um, Parler. That isn't possible. Yeah. So if, if well, you, parlor if you... is back, though, I, I, I hear what you're saying. No, there's this is a, a, you know, an absolute case where people, liberals mostly, who in other contexts would tell business owners, no, you have to do it my way. But then suddenly when, you know, conservatives are like, you have to let us in. They're like, hey, if you don't like Facebook, go f- build your own Facebook. Yeah, you exactly. know, and then they do. And then they're, you know, and then people are like, well, we're not going to host it. We're not going to allow you to access to our app stores. We're not going to do this. But Parler is back, right? It's bad, but it's not big, is it? It's not. Go- I mean, it's it's yeah. it's going to be incredibly hard to break this deadlock. It's going to take a lot of very very rich people and very very determined yeah. people, and um, and readers, right, or users, because it might be that Parler is not you know Gab before it was an alternative to Twitter. That's just it's going it, to it's actually going to be impossible because the, wh- when something like Gab for Gab is a good example. So when that started and it's dedicated to free speech, so obviously it's not going to boot <laughs> off some really horrible people. It's the, there will be horrible. Yeah. The, people there. The Joseph then, Goebbels fan club is right. like taking out all the good territory. They they got all the part right by the beach. But as soon as they're there, right, yeah. which they will be, right, inevitably, because that that's the downside of free speech is you're going to hear some horrible things, right? But the, but once they're there, then the, then the activist press can say can you know, right. cherry pick those accounts. So that's what, this is a Nazi site, right? So then it's a loss because then moderate, normal, moderate people who don't like Nazis, people like us yeah. are not going to go to that platform by for fear of guilt by association. It's all a but, very big. What, but what do you do? I mean, on Facebook, there are vast mansions. You know, our father has many mansions with many rooms and there's still an enormous amount of speech going on that Facebook frankly can't police. Um, is it so, um, I mean, is are these legal remedies or are they cultural remedies ultimately? How about we just have a situation where we don't have an exclusive group of publishers who are not uh, uh, responsible for the content of what they publish? I mean, this is a weird thing. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't see why I can't write a book which just libels people left, right and centre and not get away with it. Well, I mean... Facebook, Twitter, all the rest of them are publishers. They're not platforms. They curate their material They're quite, well, quite explicitly. It, you know, in so in an American context, that that distinction is not important in terms of uh, you know web interactive web services such as social media websites. I mean, Reason, for instance, just to give you uh, you know uh, an example, we have comments. Um, if we were liable for the content of those comments, uh, which are generated by the users. We would have no comments. Um, so the speech is, you know, would be diminished if we, if we're following the rules that you say that we should be responsible for everything that appears on our website. But that's not quite what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, uh, we, we should perhaps amend the Communications Decency Act so that it isn't so that maybe the removal of, uh, well, I suppose it could be restricted. It could be it could be changed so that, for instance, you are not responsible for illegal content that is uploaded into the comment sections of your of your website that you fail to remove. I mean, you might just not notice it, for instance, or something like that. Um, 
but that you shouldn't therefore be able to abuse that legislation to just pick and choose what you remove on the basis of that you don't agree or that you find it offensive. Maybe that would be the, the way to do it. I mean, it seems to me... So there would that, be that, no that, moderation. So then you could have a website where you would, uh, you know, Facebook would have to let every Nazi on. Uh, and every Nazi comment. And I think if it was restricted to, if they had to, if they removed illegal content, if that was, then that would be, that would be fine by me. I have no I, problem with it. I mean, content uh, personally, I agree with you, but I think this, uh, you know, one of the problems, and I don't think people have, I don't think we've worked this through because it's a relatively novel situation, but yeah, yeah. W- moderation of content and regulation of who's, who's allowed on a service, you know, do child molesters, uh, m- not child molesters, but people who talk about the sexual, you know, in a prurient way without ever touching a child are they you know should they be guaranteed ex- free expression on well, chi- facebook you know, etc the, the the idea i mean child pornography and child molestation is illegal so of right. course you can remove illegal content you know this is what i'm talking but, about uh, but i'm saying like the nambla you know uh, north american man boy love association talking about it uh, you know personally i think everybody should be allowed to talk about whatever they want pretty much wherever they want well if you but- want if you want if you want free speech, then ho- horrible yeah. people are going to talk about horrible yeah. things, right? But the different, the, there's a clear distinction between that and the actual uh, dissemination of illegal material like pornography, like child Certainly. pornography. Certainly, and that is well, a, that is actionable. I mean, in the United States, stuff can be and defamatory comment. You can you can always, if somebody calls you a son of a bitch in a Facebook page, you can go after the person. You can't go after Facebook. That's kind of worked pretty well. Well, I mean, also, I think there's let's bring the agency back to the user. You know, if, mm-hmm. if it is a platform yeah. as as Facebook and Twitter maintain. Look, if there's lots of people talking about sick, disgusting stuff about uh, sexuality or or Nazi stuff, stuff that I just find right. inherently uh, upsetting. I'll just block those people. I do it all the time. If, if someone comes on my Twitter feed and says something pro Nazi, I just block them. I do it straight away and then I never have to hear from them again. So so I don't need the people in Silicon Valley to decide for me uh, where my limits lie. And moreover, once you once you give them that power, then inevitably what happens is I now can't look at accounts of, say, gender critical feminists because they just don't happen to like their opinion. So they ditch them. I mean, that's that's my point is I'll give the power back to the individual user. Everyone has a right to say what they want, but everyone has a right to listen to what they want or not listen, as the case may be. Absolutely. I, and I think, you know, this the idea of empowering end users has kind of been pushed to the side instead of this kind of more basic root level discussion of whose speech should be allowed on what platform. Having said that, I think moderation at scale is just so difficult yeah, sure. and complicated and we're still working I, through it. Do you know, I'm actually, no. I, I should say, I do feel in a sense it's for the Silicon Valley tech giants because there's a lot of pressure on them from governments sure. to make, to, to moderate their sites and all the rest of it. As they well are. as their own Com- employees, right? I mean, I, I mean, get, that's it. That's yeah, it. you know, and, and that becomes problematic, but it's also kind of, you know, maybe a company is the sum of its employees and whatever they can gull their Well, leaders. I sort of think when a group of people at Spotify, for instance, tried to get Joe Rogan's podcast censored, or for instance, when uh, Penguin Random House in Canada, when they tried to get Jordan Peterson's book banned. At that point, I think if you work for a publisher and you don't accept that there's going to be a range of views expressed in the books that you publish, you're probably not actually right. qualified to be a publisher and you should probably be sacked. No, and no, and that's not a cancel culture thing. That's like you're simply not qualified to do the job. It would be like me saying that I want to be a professional footballer. No, my complete indolence and lack of physical fitness does exclude me from that. I agree, and it's uh, this goes back to that question of where one of the things we're witnessing is how hollow and weak, you know, uh, uh, almost calcium deficient the bones of our authorities are, uh, yeah. where companies Absolutely. and governments get pushed over. I mean, they're made of paper mache, um, which is both interesting and, and liberating and empowering and, and quite disturbing. So final uh, question, you, you cite Mill and others about, uh, you know, what in a more uh, uh, contemporary context, people like Greg Lukianoff of FIRE, um, about that a, um, a broader culture of free speech and thought is ultimately more important than any of the actual rules or laws that are written down. What are, what are some ways that, what are some steps you think we should take to get to reviving a culture or strengthening a culture of free speech and free thought, Um, you know, apart from laws and things like that, because this really is kind of, you know, it's it's a cultural phenomenon that we're going through more than a, a legal or political one, per se. I think it's a really, really good question. And I think my answer always comes back to education. I think it's about 
Uh, I mean, obviously, because I have a background as a teacher as well. I think it's it's about exposing young people to all sorts of ideas and, um, you know, encouraging them to think critically and not to just simply accept things uncritically. That would be my approach to this. I think it's very, very important, in fact. So uh, it does disturb me the way that activists have very much infiltrated schools and uh, are very much... Um, against the notion of dissent. Uh, We've seen in the UK recently critical race theory making its way into UK schools, which makes no sense because critical race theory doesn't make sense in a UK context. It's very much an American thing. Um, But that has happened. Now, I actually think you should be able to teach kids about critical race Mm -hmm. theory, but I think you should do so critically. I mean, I think you should explain why it is such a flawed uh, idea. And, 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 and that would be a wonderful thing to do with kids because it is important at the moment. It's part of our, our national discussion. So I think that should be the case. But I but I, but I think to teach any faith based position uncritically in school is not a good thing. Uh, you know, and, and, and that's why I say, you know, it does disturb me um, when I get into these stupid arguments on Twitter, the, the, the lack of critical thinking. That, that to me is is the thing that disturbs me most of all. I, I see these people and I think you've never, ever questioned any of your own views. It's never occurred to you that you might be wrong. Uh, and I think, you know, teaching kids that uh, we're always likely to be wrong about something. <laughs> just to, just assume that. It's, it's a great start. Uh, and, and, and don't just read a book and think it's right. You, know, you hear this constant refrain of educate yourself, you know, and that people, you know, activists, activists will say, well, why don't you educate? It's not my job to educate you. Educate yourself. And what they mean by that is read the books, I, the two or three books I've read <laughs> and and accept them uncritically. So basically read Ibram X. Kendi, read Robin D'Angelo and just accept everything they say. Well, no, because they're both shoddy books. That's why we shouldn't do that. We need a, a redo of To Sir With Love, right? We need to embolden, uh, you know, working class British kids to push back against their teachers. I haven't actually seen To Sir With Love. From what I understand, it's a kind of precursor of Dangerous Minds. Is that right? Yes, very much that... so. It's, it, okay. uh, and it's, uh, it, it has its own problems as a teacher savior movie. But uh, Okay. Well, we're that gonna... appeal to me as an ex-teacher. Yeah. I would is, uh, is, so uh, a final question. I mean, you invented Titania McGrath and you get to live in in a world where, you know, after the nuclear po- holocaust or, you know, environmental despoilation, the next civilization may well revere Titiana McGrath or Titania McGrath, you know, unironically. Is she having a moment or is, uh, is her time, you know, is her time horizon limited now? Are you optimistic or pessimistic? It's definitely limited. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I tweet very rarely from her account now, you know, but, but then because I'm focused on so many I mean, like things. the larger worldview she represents. Well, uh, the problem is, of course, is is with Titania. I mean, just at the point where, you know, I, I, I feel like I, I've done a lot of what I can do with that. Um, it's actually more relevant than it ever was. And that's the that's the really annoying thing. So I will continue with I'll continue with the live show, for instance. And we'll, if I'm going to do anything more with her, it will be developing it out. You know, I've done books and I've done the tweets and I think that's great. But it, a, a live thing is is a really fun thing so we're going to do some live shows in september with with the character but um you know i, I whether that idea i mean this is the problem is that every time i think there's a bit of a pushback, you know, something good happens and and, and the, the activists don't win in a particular fight. And you think, oh, there's a pushback happening. It's starting and it never does. It's it's just a little glitch. Um, it's it's always regressing. And and I, I think, uh, you know, and it's it's got to the point where now people like me who who espouse liberal values, uh, free speech, equality, etc. That's quite a controversial thing to espouse now. That's weird. I never thought that would happen. You know, I'd never, I, I never ever thought that would happen. So um, I don't know, you know, I'm not a prophet. I don't know when this will all end. I, I, I think it must, though. I think for, if it doesn't, well, then I uh, we're all screwed. Well, I think You've made a pretty good start with all of your work, but especially your new book, Free Speech and Why It Matters. Andrew Doyle, thanks for talking. Thank you very much. 